<laughs> Pulpit made it in place. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hey, good morning. Good morning. It's good to be in church. Pray for my voice. I'm on a slow decline today, and I'm praying that we just kind of turn the corner and ramp back up. You pray for my voice, and, and uh, we're going to trust God to, to help us today. So I apologize already because it, it's annoying me. <laughs> I want to encourage you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor Luke, for praying for our nation and be in prayer for our nation. After the events of yesterday and the attempted assassination of President Trump, it highlights again that we need to be praying for our country. There's trouble, there's turmoil. We need God to come and bring stability into our nation. And it's not going to come through a person or a party. It's going to come through the presence of God. And we need God's presence and his power. Um, we need his peace to, to blanket our nation. And uh, we're just trusting God. Um, someone sent this message to me just a little while ago. There was an assassination, if you'll remember, those of you that were around in the 80s, when President Reagan and his response after that attempted assassination is, whatever happens now, I owe my life to God, and I will try to serve him in every way that I can. And I pray that that would be Donald Trump's prayer as well. We need God. Be praying for our team that's going to El Salvador. Jerry, I don't know how many are here this morning, but uh, four, of, four of you? All right. We, uh, well, you guys just stand who, who are going to El Salvador so we can see who, who are going. And uh, awesome, awesome. Be praying. We're trusting. God's got some great things in store. I want to just say to all of you joining online, we're honored that you are here with us today. And, uh, you know, here's the thing about our online crew. You guys get to see us, but we never get to see you. And uh, we're always encouraged to know that there are uh, a huge number of people joining us online, but we never quite know who you are. So I want to ask you to do something for me today. If you would take a minute right now even and just, I'm trying to determine whether I should give my phone number out or should I just do email. I'm going to do my phone number, okay? So here's what you can do. Send me a text right now, my number. Just let me know where you are, your name. Maybe, maybe give us your contact information because you're part of our church just like people right here. And so we, we want to be able to pastor you and help you any way that we can. So if you're watching online and you would just text my, my phone number, 515-778-0808. 515-778-0808. I'll wait for this thing just to start buzzing and blowing up and I'll probably want to turn it off. And if any of you don't have my number, please put that in your phone. Um, and uh, our, all of our numbers are accessible to you and we want to be available. So just that sometimes my heart just hurts knowing that there are people that are part of our church on the other side of that camera and we don't know who you are. And so we really want to uh, want you to reach out to us. All right. Hey, it's good to uh, be in a time getting into the Word. We're continuing in our series in the book of Genesis. Somewhere in Genesis, you don't even give me a chance to give the Scripture reference. Go ahead and turn to Genesis 43. We're going to get there eventually, but I've got a few comments that I want to make ahead of time and just kind of bring us up to speed with, with where we've been. I want to start by referring to a, a, a verse of scripture found in Romans chapter 2 verse 4 that tells us that it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. In Joseph's story, we have the story of Joseph from Genesis 37 all the way to the end of Genesis chapter 50. And especially the uh, chapter that we're going to be reading today in chapter 43, it speaks of Joseph's kindness that led to restoration of relationship with his family. 
And so I'm praying today that we who are, are, are hearing today, that our hearts would be open, that we would understand and realize today the kindness of God. That just as the choir is saying, all my life, you have been faithful. All of my life, God has been so, so good that even when I can't see it, even when I can't feel it, I know that God is always working things together for good. That is a foundation that all of us ought to put our life on. Because what I see right now in this moment, it might tell me a different story. But I know the big picture, God who sees it all, who knows it all, he knew where Joseph was going in the beginning. He gave him a dream. But the context of that dream didn't make a whole lot of sense. It caused his brothers to respond in a very negative way. If they only knew what God was going to do in their brother Joseph, it was providing for them and their life and sustaining their life. We have to trust God. There is a bigger plan. There is a bigger picture. Let God guide your life. Allow him to order your steps, to put things in your life back together where some things have been seemingly falling apart. But when it seems like it's falling apart, I have to trust that God is putting things together. It seems like it's coming apart, but I believe it's all coming together as we trust God. So at the end of my message, I'm going to give you a chance to respond in a couple of ways. One, by giving your life to him and just saying, God, I'm going to trust you with my life to be my Lord, to be my Savior. And as we look at the restoration of relationships through Joseph this morning, I, I suspect that many in the room today, you have a, a situation or a circumstance with a friend or a family member, a child or a parent that uh, is a relationship that needs restored. And I'm gonna, I want us to pray at the end and trust that God is working even in those circumstances and those relationships, even with what it looks like with my eye today, it's not the whole story. We can trust God. We've been looking at the life of Joseph and one of the things that we haven't highlighted is all of the ways the many ways that Joseph's life and his experiences parallel or point to Jesus. And I just want to name five of those things, but there's probably a list of 50 or more of ways that Joseph is a picture of Jesus or his life parallels that of Jesus. One, like Jesus, Joseph was greatly loved by his father. You remember in Matthew chapter 3 where John is baptizing Jesus and there is a voice from heaven that says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm, I'm well pleased. And at the beginning of Joseph's story in, in Genesis 37, I think it's about verse 3, it says that Joseph of all of Jacob's sons, he loved Joseph more than any other of the other children. They were, they were both loved by their father. Like Jesus, Joseph had people plotting to kill him. Like Jesus, Joseph became a servant. Like Jesus, Joseph was falsely accused and unjustly punished. Like Jesus, Joseph was eventually elevated from a place of suffering to a powerful throne, saving his people from death. So, two weeks ago, in the story of Joseph, we had seen that he was made ruler of all of Egypt, in charge of the whole land, second in command only to Pharaoh. But most of what happened in the land of Egypt, which was governing the, almost the entire world at that point, they came to Joseph. I'm amazed at the verse in chapter 41, verse 38, where Pharaoh asked his officials, can we find anyone else like this man, speaking of Joseph, so obviously filled with the Spirit of God? I'm, I'm not believing that Pharaoh was that spiritual of a guy following uh, Yahweh. But he obviously saw in him the Spirit of God, and he said, there's nobody else like Joseph so filled with the Holy Spirit. We need him 
on our team. And he puts Joseph in that position. He's at the peak of power in Egypt over the entire world. The Egyptian empire is a place of incredible influence, of educational advancement, military power, and limitless wealth. And we're going to see that they get wealthier as time goes on. Joseph had power and all this influence at his fingertips. And he used it so well. All through Joseph's life, he never stopped serving God. From the dreams of Pharaoh that Joseph interpreted, it happened exactly as he predicted. There were seven years of incredible prosperity. Bumper crops, so much grain that it says like the sands of the seashore. There was not enough uh, ways that they could even keep records of what they had. There was too much to measure. And then following those seven years of prosperity came seven years of incredible famine. And people from all around the region came to Egypt, came to Joseph to buy food. Chapter 42, uh, we saw that Joseph, or Jacob sends out his 10 sons to Egypt to buy enough grain to keep us alive is what he said. They were going to all die if they didn't get some food. And since Joseph was in charge, it was to him that his brothers came. In Genesis 42, 6, it tells us that when they arrived, when the brothers arrived in Egypt, they came to Joseph and it says that they bowed before Joseph with their faces to the ground. The fulfillment of the dream that had come more than 20 years before this. 20, more than 20 years have passed. Joseph recognized his brothers instantly, but they had no idea who he was. It is amazing what 20 years can do to our lives, especially when we're talking about a 17-year-old to a 37-plus-year-old. Can I show you a picture of someone in the congregation this morning when they were 18 years old. Here we go. Can I show you a picture of another person when they were 18 years old? Here's, here's the question that I have for you this morning. Why did you laugh at both of us? Didn't you think we were 18 once? Guess what? You were too. If you want to text a picture of your 18-year-old self, <laughs> my number. <laughs> go, back, go back to, Zach, show that, that other picture of me. This is my, no, that, that one, that one. No, not that one. Oh, that's all there is? Oh, look at me. Look at me. I am a class officer of the class of 1985, my junior year. That's me in the OP t-shirt right there. Anybody remember OP t-shirts? I wore OP when it wasn't cool to wear OP. I got them when they were marked down and the fad was gone. <laughs> Nobody else is wearing them. I got them off the markdown rack. That's how, that's how I roll. But that, that's 17-year-old that's Pastor Jeff. I wasn't even a pastor then. Um, 20 years later to the year, is this, this picture right here. I don't know if you think either one of those look like me. I think it looks exactly like me, and that's our family uh, in 2004. Little Pastor Zach, Pastor Bree down there on the bottom corner, and all of our, all of our we had just gotten Ethan uh, from Korea. He was eight months old, and we had a family picture taken right after he came home to the U.S., and so... 20 years makes a huge difference. So while Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not at all recognize him. And he, it was obvious. They had no idea. And obviously because Joseph was ruler in Egypt, he probably looked something like this. That doesn't look like their brother. Their brother is a Hebrew. Who's this Egyptian guy? Never would they have ever thought they thought he was dead. They had no idea. Joseph spoke harshly to his brothers. Why did he do that? He accused them of being spies. And their response was, we've simply come to buy food. We're all, we're all brothers, members of the same family. We're honest men, sir. We're not spies. I want you to put yourself in Joseph's place. 
How must Joseph have felt these 20 plus years later? The last time he was face to face with his brothers, they were plotting to kill him. They threw him into an empty cistern. And the scripture gives a little bit of detail. They threw him in a cistern, and then what did they do next? They sat down and ate a meal together. Interesting that that scripture would include that they're eating a meal together while they just threw their brother in a cistern to leave him to die. Judah gets an idea when he sees the Egyptian band kind of going by, slave traders. He's like, why do we want blood to be on our hands? Let's just sell him and get some money for him, sell him as a slave to Egypt. And that's exactly what they did. So that is the last encounter that Joseph had with his brothers. Now, 20 years later, they come and they're bowing down before me. One of the brothers unknowingly gave Joseph some information that he wanted because he further pleaded his case. He said, look, we're 12 brothers in all. One of all, there are 10 of us here. One of our brothers is with us no more. Who's that? The guy they're talking to, but they have no idea. And Benjamin, the youngest brother, who is at home with their dad. Joseph, without even asking, finds out his dad and Benjamin are alive and well. I'm guessing that he thinks in his mind, they did this to me. What are the chances that Benjamin is even alive? What are the chances that dad's even around? But he unknowingly gets this information and he says, there's one way you can prove your innocence that you're telling the truth. Bring your youngest brother to me. And then he throws him in prison for three days. Three days is nothing compared to what Joseph has spent in prison. But when he releases them, the scripture gives us insight into a conversation they're having amongst themselves, and the conversation goes something like this. Clearly, we, were be, we are being punished of what we did to Joseph a long time ago. We saw his anguish as he pleaded for his life, but we didn't listen, and that's why we're in this trouble. Why in the world would they think, why would they attach those dots? Why would they connect those dots? Obviously, He's accusing us of being spies because we sold our brother Joseph as a slave 20 years ago. Now we have this trouble. Joseph says, I'm going to send you guys home with food for your families. I'm going to keep one of you here. He puts Simeon, the second oldest, in prison and says, listen, he, he's a hostage here until you bring your brother Benjamin back to prove that you're telling me the truth. Story of Joseph. He went from a promise given by God to um, being thrown into a pit and then sold as a slave in Potiphar's house, falsely accused, thrown into prison, and now he finds himself promoted to prime minister, second in command to Pharaoh. He's gone from being in prison for a long extended period of time to now ruling in Egypt. The timing is incredible. Like in a moment, he went from prison to the palace. Don't ever think don't ever say that God can't do something in your life. Don't ever think that God can't do something in your life. He may not make you the leader of a nation, but I would say that the more that you understand God, the more you will realize the tremendous potential that exists in a relationship, in a partnership with God, that he can promote you in a moment just like that. So with Joseph in this position of power, now his brother's showing up, there's some tests that Joseph is going to face, that he's facing, and really tests that we face as well, and we need God's help to overcome those things. First test that Joseph is going to face is how will he conform to his environment? You see, he's, he grew up as a Hebrew. Scripture tells us that he part-time was a, a, a sheep herder. He was a shepherd. He was pretty much dad's favorite. I think he didn't do a lot once in a while, he'd go watch, watch the sheep out in the field. But now, he's promoted to the ruler of the world, pretty much. How will he conform to his environment? How are we, how are we conforming to our present environment? It's a question we need to ask. Joseph has a foot in two worlds. He's a Hebrew. He grew up a Hebrew. Now he's a ruler in Egypt. Will he attempt to become Egyptian? Will Egypt rub off on him, or is he going to stay faithful to his Hebrew roots? Will he become somebody that he's not? 
Are we conforming to the world around us or are we being transformed? Romans 12, 2 says, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world. Don't copy the behaviors and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. We need God to change the way that we think. We need God to change the way that we see things in this world, not conforming to the world around us. There's way too much of that going on. We need a transformation to take place on the inside, from our hearts and from our minds, to become who God wants us to be. It's okay that Joseph was in Egypt. It's okay that he's wearing the clothes. But Joseph doesn't change who he is. He passes this test. Even though Pharaoh gives him a new name, he's saying, listen, Joseph sounds way too Hebrew. We're going to call you Zaphonoth Paneah. There you go. That has a ring to it, doesn't it? And he gave him an Egyptian wife named Asenath, and they had two kids. Listen, the success and opportunity, I talked about this a few weeks ago, success and opportunity can be seductions that cause us to sin, that will ruin our lives. But Joseph doesn't allow the success, and he doesn't allow the opportunity that he has to destroy his life. Joseph remains true to his roots. We see that before he dies, 80 years later, he makes a request. He said, one day, God is going to take you out of Egypt. And when he does, I want you to dig up my bones, and I want you to take me with you. His heart was with his people. His position didn't cause him to forget his roots. Egypt had been good, but he understood that it was God who had blessed him. The second test that he has to pass is, what's he going to do about his past? Now that he's ruling in Egypt, he's in charge of the whole land, he has the opportunity to go back to Potiphar and Potiphar's wife who falsely accused him and he could do whatever he wants to, he's in charge. Or how about his 12 brothers back in Israel? How about we get the army and we just go surround them and say, look who's in charge now, guys. He could have done that. What is he gonna do about his past? We see Joseph doesn't focus at all on the past, but on the present and the future rather than getting even. I wonder how many of us this morning sitting here are living in the past. We're stuck to some event or relationship in the past and we're unable to enjoy the present and we have no thought of the future. I wonder how many of our lives are being slowly destroyed by bitterness and the desire to get revenge for a wrong that happened to us that we suffered in the past. We need to trust God's plans and God's purposes. And that's what Joseph did. He's always working things together for good. Joseph named his first son Manasseh. He and Asenath, they had a son. He named him Manasseh, which means to forget. And he said, God has made me forget all my trouble and everyone in my family. He wanted to forget what was was in the past. He named his second son Ephraim, which means fruitful, literally doubly blessed. He's saying, in the midst of the struggle that I've been through, God has made me and my life fruitful. Are we allowing God to make us fruitful in our suffering, or are we just having a pity party? Because he'll make us fruitful if we will just trust him through the suffering. Here's what I want you to discover if you haven't already. God wants to do something in your life that you never dreamed possible. God wants to do something in your life, but you can't allow the past to destroy your present or your future. We're gonna be praying in just a moment. Restoration of relationships. I want want all of us to open our heart to the Lord and let his kindness draw us closer to him. I want our lives to exude and exhibit the kindness of God that is all about restoring relationships and bringing people closer in our lives. The third test that Joseph has to pass is, what's he going to do when his past shows up and stirs up the old feelings that he used to have? What do we do when someone from our past, right in front of us, You may have forgiven whatever happened, but the phrase forgive and forget, a lot easier said than done. 
We can forgive. That's a choice. And I would encourage all of us to take that step of of forgiveness and forgiveness being just not taking hold of it, letting go of it. We can't forget for sure. It's hard to do that. But what do you do when you're confronted with your past? After 20 years, there were still some things that Joseph had to deal with even though he'd made up his mind to forget his troubles. If Joseph hadn't made up his mind in advance to forget it, to forgive his brothers, they probably would have rotted in that prison instead of only being there for three days. Jesus said in his prayer, when he taught the disciples how to pray, right in the middle of the Lord's prayer, he says, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Man, that's an incredible phrase. Forgive us our sins, Lord, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Listen, he says, don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Don't give in to the temptation. Rescue us. Verse 14 says, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. We need to be the ones to take the first step. Listen, The notes from my fire Bible say this about forgiveness. The Greek word forgive here, 140 times we see it in the New Testament. It can have meanings from from to let go, to leave behind, to dismiss, or to cancel a debt. Let go, leave it behind, dismiss it, or cancel a debt. It's a word that's used by God's forgiveness toward us. We're to forgive the same way that he does. We're going to go to our our reading in Genesis. I want to just highlight a few things just for sake of time here. I had you turn to 43. I'm going to back up to chapter 42 and just make a couple of observations. I want you to notice that in these chapters, and I'm going to probably just ask you to go and read these yourself. This is a narrative, and it's it's incredible uh, story. I, I, the story of Joseph is, is an incredible story. But notice the kindness of Joseph that we see. And the response of Jacob and the response of Jacob's sons to the kindness of Joseph. They live, obviously, with a guilty conscience. I mean, that was them speaking. Man, this is all happening because we did that to Joseph 20-some years ago. And that's the lens that they're seeing everything through. Joseph heaps kindness and kindness. He could do anything he wants to, but we see him being kind to his family. And their responses misinterpret everything. They're skeptical, they're negative, they're blaming. They take off on their journey back home. Joseph has filled their sacks. This is in chapter 42. He's filled their sacks with grain as full as they can, and he ordered that money be put into their sacks, the money that they'd paid. He was giving it back to them. They stop for the night, verse 27 of chapter 42. They stop for the night, and one of them opened his sack to get grain for his donkey, and he found his money at the top of his sack. Anybody ever found money? What's your reaction when you find money? I mean, something like, woo-hoo, right? Like, (laughs) yay me. I was at Quick Trip one day, and I'm walking in the sidewalk, going into Quick Trip. I looked down, I saw something on the ground, a $100 bill. Anybody ever found a $100 bill? (laughs) I took that, I, I walked into Quick Trip, and I'm thinking, what do I do with this thing? Like, Who saw me? Who's watching me? Did someone put that there? Is this a test? Man, here's the thing. I understand a little bit about what they're going through here. But when you find money, it is incredible. You know what? I was so ridden with guilt that there was a camera. Somebody was sitting in a car watching me. I'm thinking, this isn't my money in the first place. So I took it to the guy behind the counter. Guess who probably kept that $100 bill? Not my problem to worry about, but listen, he found money in the top of his sack. Look, he exclaimed to his brothers, my money has been returned. It's here in my sack. Their response, their hearts sank. 
What has God done to us? Punish. They're looking at his punishment. Joseph was being kind, saying, listen, you're going to be back for more. I'm just putting the money back in your sack because I want to bless you guys. You're my family. You're my brothers. They get back home and it says, verse 35, as they emptied their sacks there, in each man's sack was the bag of money that had been paid for the grain. They all got money back. The brothers and their father Jacob were terrified when they saw the bags of money. Jacob explained, you're robbing me of my children. Joseph is gone, Simeon's gone, and now you want to take Benjamin back? Everything is going against me. Do you see how this guilty conscience causes them to look at everything wrongly? Joseph was just being kind. Jacob goes on to say in verse 38, my son will not go with you. There's no way I'm sending Jake, uh, Benjamin back to Egypt with you. We're all going to starve. We're all going to die here because Benjamin, I'm not letting him go. Chapter 43, the famine continued to ravage the land of Canaan. And when the grain that they had bought from Egypt was almost gone, Jacob said to his sons, go back and buy us a little more food. But Judah said, the man was serious. When he warned us, you won't see my face again unless your brother is with you. If you send Benjamin with us, we will go down and buy more food. But if you don't let Benjamin go, we won't go either. We're not going unless Benjamin goes with us. Remember the man said, you won't see my face unless your brother is with you. Why are you so cruel to me? Jacob says. Jacob had a name change. Do you remember that? Before this, what was his name changed to? Israel. What does Jacob mean? Deceiver. God changed his name. You know what's interesting to me about Jacob? Other people get their name changed in the Bible, and they start using that name all the time. Why are we still seeing the name Jacob instead of some of your versions? I know it says Israel. I'm reading Jacob here. But they are used interchangeably from that point on. There's still some work going on in Jacob's life, and he's looking at this like, you're cruel to me. Why, why, did you, why did you even tell them that you had another brother? Why didn't you lie to them? He's going, listen, how are we to know? He just asked us questions. He said, how's your father? What about your other brother? I want you to bring him here. Judah said, send the boy with me, verse 8, and we will be on our way. Otherwise, we will all die of starvation. Not only we, but you and our little ones. I personally guarantee his safety. You may hold me responsible if I don't bring him back to you. Then let me bear the blame forever. If we hadn't wasted all this time, we could have gone and returned twice by now. So their father Jacob finally said to them, if it can't be avoided, then do this. And he asked, tells him, take some gifts with you. And he just relents. They go down to Egypt with Benjamin. They return. Verse 15, the men packed uh, Jacob's gifts and double the money, and they headed off with Benjamin. They finally arrived in Egypt and presented themselves to Joseph. And when Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the manager of the household, these men will eat with me this noon. Take them inside the palace, go slaughter an animal, and prepare a big feast. They're feasting in the midst of a famine. They're coming just to get some grain to sustain them. And this This man in Egypt said, listen, I want them to come to my house. We're going to have a big feast. How do they respond by this? Verse 18, the brothers were terrified. (laughs) Terrified. Why is he bringing us? Why is he bringing us to his house? Here's what's going to happen. He's going to make us all slaves. Going to take our donkeys, make us slaves. He's going to pretend that we stole the money that, that, that was in our bags. They just have this whole, they they can't see anything for what it is because of the guilty conscience. The brothers, verse 19, approached the manager of Joseph's household. They're, They're in the household now and spoke to him at the entrance of the palace. Sir, they said, we came to Egypt once before to buy food. They don't even know who this guy is. They got such a guilty conscience. They see the guy in his house. He's going, listen, we got the money. We didn't take it, really. I don't know how it happened, but... We brought it all back. It's all there. And then some. We brought more money too. And you, you can have it all. Listen, we didn't, we didn't steal the money. Such a guilty conscience. 
And what was his response? Verse 23, relax. Don't be afraid. This is the household manager of Joseph in Egypt. The guy should not be a believer in God. But listen to what he says. Your God, the God of your father, must have put this treasure into your sacks. I know I received payment. It must just be a blessing from God. It takes an Egyptian to turn their attention back to God. They come in. When Joseph comes into the home, they give him the gifts that they brought, and they bowed low to the ground. Verse 26. After greeting them, he asked, how's your father, the old man that you spoke about? Is he still alive? Yes, they replied. Our father is your servant, is alive and well. And they bowed low again. There's a whole lot of bowing going on here. They don't even know who they're bowing to. Joseph brings them into his, his home, sets them down to eat a meal. He's overwhelmed with emotion. He sets them at a table and sets them in order of birth order. And they're all looking at this going, you guys realize how we're sitting around this table? What are the odds that we would be seated in birth order around this table? Isn't that odd? Isn't that strange? What are the chances of 11 random people being seated in order at a table? One in 40 million that somebody who didn't know them would set them in that order. Obviously, God is showing them his blessing. Verse 34, Joseph filled their place with food from his table, giving Benjamin five times as much as he gave the others. They feasted and they drank freely. Joseph just is kind, but he's testing them all the time. Give, give Benjamin five times as much. You know what they did to me when I was the favored son? He gave Benjamin five times as much, and there was no reaction. All of a sudden, we see a change of heart. God is all the time positioning pieces together in our life for a more incredible and beautiful outcome than we could ever imagine. Ephesians 3.20 is a verse that I love. All glory to God who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. It's the kindness of Joseph that is restoring the relationships When we submit and surrender and bow our knee to Jesus, when we realize our need for him, there's an incredible relationship that starts. All the tests that Joseph put his brothers through were showing whether their hearts had been changed. How did they respond when Benjamin got the special treatment? How do we respond when people get special treatment? How do you respond when someone else is blessed? Do you celebrate with those people? Or is there jealousy or envy or resentment or anger or bitterness, those kind of things? Listen, we've got to realize that there is a bigger picture of things going on here. Let's trust God's plans and his purpose. We don't live just in this little tunnel with tunnel vision. Man, God sees it all. He knows it all. And if we say we trust him, and we say that we believe that God is good and that he does good, that he's kind and that kindness should draw us closer to a relationship with him. The goodness of God is to everyone. God has been so, so good. How many of you would say that's true? And he wants to be good. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. 2 Peter 3.9 says that God is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance. Romans 2.4, don't you see how wonderfully kind and tolerant and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? It's his kindness that draws you to repentance. 
that if we confess our sins, God is what? Faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Acts 3, verse 19 says, Repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Then times of refreshment will come in the presence of the Lord. God has good for us, only good. And even through the darkest valleys, God is with you. That's what the psalmist said. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, you're with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. There are things that we can gain in the valleys of life that we can't gain any other way. And it just proves to us again and again that God is so good. Can I encourage you today to not blame God or get bitter or get angry because he doesn't answer your prayer how you want him to. I'm thankful that God doesn't answer all my prayers the way I ask him because the way I'm asking isn't always the best way. I've got a limited perspective, but he's got an unlimited view and his love for you is so good. This morning, I want to ask you to respond. I want to ask you to stand with me this morning. And the response is this simply, do you need to open your heart and life to Jesus to make him Lord of your life? Or maybe there is a relationship in your life that is not in a good place. Do we believe and trust that God can restore that relationship? I believe as it's up to us to choose to forgive, just like Joseph did, it gives opportunity for that. We can't make people do anything. But will you trust him? With your heads bowed and your eyes closed this morning, how many of you would say this morning, I need a relationship with Jesus and I'm not walking with him. I need a restoration of a relationship with Jesus this morning. Is there anyone just by raising your hand, you'd say, that's me, Pastor Jeff. And I want to pray with you to receive Jesus restore that relationship. Thank you. Thank you. How many of you would say this morning, there's a relationship in my life. Things are good with God, but there's a relationship in my life that needs restored. Maybe it's with a child or with a parent or a friend. And you'd say, it is a constant constant battle, constant mental challenge in my life, and you just raise your hand and say, it's me, I've got a relationship that I need restored. Hands all across the room. I want to ask you to respond as they sing this song. And if you want to come for prayer, I encourage you, just come. And let's receive from the Lord this morning.